we're a Canadian cultural phenomenon, you know. You know, people weren't coming up when we first started and saying, you know, oh, this happened to me because of Try. They were just going, I saw you on TV, and it was easy. But so it developed gradually because I think we've been around a lot, so we've been a broader part of some people's lives. You know, sometimes people are telling you stories that are 10 years old, but that were important to them. In the world of music, the word institution is usually reserved for artists that have established themselves over a long period of time. You know, they've been around for a long time, they've sold a lot of records, they've proven themselves. Blue Rodeo can certainly be described as an institution. Over the course of almost 20 years, the band has put out more than 10 records. They've sold over 2 million albums in Canada alone, and they are not slowing down as evidence from a cross-Canada tour, all to support the brand new disc, Palace of Gold. Now, we've joined the band for a few days on the road, 21 dates into their cross-Canada tour, all to tell you the story of Blue Rodeo. You've been asked lots of times about the band's longevity, and it seems to surprise other people way more than it surprises you that you're still here. Oh, I think just seeing a band stick around for 16, 17 years is, is a big deal. Um, but I think that we would be playing regardless of what happened to us. You know, we just we started out just to play in Toronto, and if that was what had happened, I think we'd still be all right with that. I think just the act of making music is is what keeps us going. Mm. So we would do it in one form or another. It's been a, uh, a great adventure. You know, it's been, you know, it's a roller coaster ride all the time, but what isn't? Blue Rodeo's roots go back to the high school friendship between Greg Keeler and Jim Cuddy in Toronto in the 70s. Both played guitar and sang. Their first band was formed in 1977 called the Hi Fi's. The early 80s would find the duo moving to New York City with the hope of recruiting new members. And the bad things are, I guess, people get mugged on the way to rehearsals and it's hard to keep a band together. It's tough, you know, it's not, you can't play a lot, you can't, uh, you just try to get a big deal. And you spend a long time trying to get a big deal, and then you kind of think, if you don't get a big deal, that maybe it's not worth it, and you like to go someplace where you could play. For a band that loves to play and wanting a record deal, returning to Toronto was the logical choice. Shortly after returning home to Toronto, the duo expanded to include bassist Basil Donovan, keyboardist Bobby Wiseman, and drummer Cleve Anderson in 1984. The band would become a Toronto club favorite with a sound that embraced rock, pop, jazz, blues, folk, and country elements, all delivered with energetic and emotional performances. Just let it ride. They were smart because one of the first things that attracted people to Blue Rodeo was that they'd play uh, after Last Call. So when all the other bands finished their sets, you just pour down to wherever they were playing and you'd uh, get some more music for your night. Grab one beer and sit down and take it in. But then you get there and they actually, they were great. Falling, 
they were unique then, and I think still in some ways because they have the, there's a country feel obviously to it, but they've got a real pop Beatles influence there too. But, but in those days, nobody expected to have any success playing music coming out of Toronto, so you just so you just made music you felt you felt like making as a result. So you got this weird hybrid that, that was Blue Rodeo. Jimmy's voice and Greg's energy, I think, were the big things, you know. And and Bob Wiseman in those days was. This crazy keyboard player, but Jim, you hear him sing that, and, you know, people, their hair would stand up on their arm, and Greg just, just teared his guitar with sort of that, you know, madman's abandoned. And I think the buzz was warranted. Say the Joker rewind, Joker rewind, Joker rewind, Joker rewind. We play something that's similar to country, but we certainly don't want to confuse people and have a bunch of hardcore country fans come down and beat the living daylights well, out Well, I guess of we don't want to offend, play. you know, people who are really in the country. I'm sure it doesn't enter any of our thinking anymore. I, mean, I don't even think it did at the beginning, that we would rather be something different. I think we were always glad that somehow we were uh, not boundaried and that we could, um, we could just do what came naturally to us. With Canada, there was never a question about formats with this band. Everyone loved the rodeo. It seemed that you got burned in the U.S. by them telling you what you were doing. Well, we just play so much up here. And I think that to understand the band, you have to, you know, if you have the time or the inclination, to come out and see <laughs> us a few times. You know, if, if, and, and back in those days, we would play every weekend, and we were just playing all the time. But I think that the people who would come and see us all the time just really enjoyed you know, the adventure that, you know, that we would sort of try to take, and, and uh, we never did that in America. We couldn't, it's so big, you know? And I don't think you can really understand us from a record or a video. It is something that, you know, you know we, we did play all the time. Wiseman would exit the group in 1992, while Anderson would eventually be replaced by new drummer Glenn Milcham in late 1991. I got sad, thinking, God, it was sad to lose Bobby and Cleve, because that was a great band. That was really a different, you know, band. But at the time, we just plugged along as if nothing was going on at all, you know? So just gotta get them, gotta get a keyboard player. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta do Ontario place, well, we better get one soon. <laughs> yeah, that'll be his first yeah. gig. <laughs> so now every night, you insist on a major label deal was signed with Warner Music Canada in early 1987. The band's major label debut, Outskirts, was released the same year. Do you remember the Rolling Stone review for Outskirts? Did you take it as a compliment at the time? Oh, huge. Yeah, I thought we were made. Until we read the next week's at Rolling Stone and it said that about somebody else. <laughs> so, I mean, that was, but that was a good sobering lesson, you know, that uh, if you read something so superlative about yourself in a major magazine, do you really think you're, you're going to skip over all the stages necessary to being popular? And uh, it has no, it had no effect. <laughs> Conversely, our first review, which I remember when I was working, I was working doing props, TV commercial. The review comes out in the Globe, which is our first review of a record ever. And uh, didn't like it. Eh? Well, he, it was, and the guy, somebody said, uh, "Hey, look, there's a review," and started reading it. So 40 people stopped working and listened. And about halfway through, the guy said, "I don't think I should continue." It was just terrible. And you know how little effect did that have? <laughs> it had no effect at all. You know, that's still one of our best-selling records. Outskirts would not explode out of the gate immediately, as early radio airplay was sporadic at best. It wasn't until Much Music put the album's second single, Try, into high rotation that radio would catch on. The single would eventually hit top five in Canada, pushing sales of Outskirts to near-platinum status by year's end, and eventually well over double platinum. Things must be going crazy for you right now with Try. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice crazy. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's, it's the type of thing it's hard to complain about, you know, people being very enthused about one of your songs. So, yeah, it's a, it's a nice crazy. And here's an example of our song where 
it, radio hadn't picked up on it, but because Much Music played it a lot, and you know the, the people who watch Much Music liked the song and liked the video, that radio finally had to play it. And now I got a radio hit. Try, when that song was breaking, your life was changing. Back then, we still had jobs, and uh, so we'd go on these short jaunts. I mean, our, our drummer then was a post office employee. We were lucky that back then there was frequent strikes. And so we'd just do these little jaunts, you know, we'd zip out east or something. So we were just oblivious, because we came back, our world was sort of playing in Toronto, doing our jobs, going out to these places. We'd be surprised that they'd be full, but we'd just think, well, that must be the way it is in Halifax, or that must be the way it is in Ottawa. And it wasn't until, you know, a few years later, I thought, man, that, that made a huge difference. That made us known all over the country. With Outskirts, Blue Rodeo had begun their long and steady journey into Canadian pop consciousness. Coming up, on the road with the band... Tour bus etiquette. You can go to the bathroom, but... Number one. You can go pee, you can't go poo. There's no pooing in the bathroom. No. <laughs> and more as we tell the story of Blue Rodeo. Our little ball hockey. And the cutties are hackers. They're terrible. Here, you can get a shot. Why? Look at that. <laughs> That's from the game. They can't play the game. Oh. So they have to compensate with the chippiness. Oh, it's Blue Rodeo's 2002-2003 Palace of Gold Tour started November 1st in Vancouver. 31 cities and three and a half months later, the winter tour will end February 15th. The tour will travel from coast to coast. There's an energy that is happening just before you get there. You know, Blue Rodeo's coming to town. And it's like they really appreciate that you've made the effort to be there and entertain them. And especially when you get into like Prince George and Grand Prairie and those smaller arenas. And it actually has been like maybe even a year since there's been somebody there. Mm. And, uh, and you, you really feel appreciated and, and it's fun to play for those people. It's marvelous to get to places like Lethbridge and Red Deer and Medicine Hat and Prince George, right? Yellowknife. How else would you get to these places? And so for me, it's a fascinating adventure. I, I love it. Why would a band tour Canada in the winter, though? I think there's practical reasons. Uh, there's not a lot of competition. It's a favorite time for us to tour. Because you know when you come to town, it's, it's going to be an event. I, I hope so. I think we want to preserve the, the good weather for ourselves. You know, we take more holidays in the summer. I think also, you know what, we found that it, there's not as much traffic out there. It's just we can sort of be by ourselves. And we can do what we, what we want. It's easier to get hauls. And everything seems to just go smoother. Breaks yeah. up the winter nicely. Yeah. Mm. So it is a nice way to, to see the country. Tour bus etiquette, you can go to the bathroom, but number one, you can go pee, you can't go poo. There's no pooing in the bathroom. No. Okay. <laughs> Clean up after yourself. Okay. Where am I sleeping? You're sleeping at James Gray's old bunk. Okay, because he's, he's got the... He's going to the back lounge. Okay. Yeah. You don't snore, do you? I don't know, I'm always asleep. There you go, you're your cell for the night. You know what would really make my bunk the best? If I had a TV. Yeah, you got a TV now. Get the got something right here. I'll just get you the right input. Go on here. Let's see. Nighty night. 
What was the first tour across Canada like? Um, you didn't have rigs and buses, I don't think. No, we did. The first tour was the van, you know, the classic van. And then the first time we decided to do Canada was just after Diamond Mine came out, like to do it coast to coast. And we knew nothing about doing. So we we took no time in for sleep whatsoever. We just thought, oh, cam loops, and then we look, you know. Okay, nine hour drive, and then and we'd wake up every morning, drive all day, get there just in time for the show. We were fighting like crazy, and we just couldn't handle each other by the end of that tour. And then we went, we decided, okay, well, we'll do the next one, get a tour bus, right? Well, we still fought like crazy. <laughs> but it was, but now you can retire to your own bunk. Well, after. yeah, you can actually pull your curtains shut if you have to. <laughs> it is a far cry from the days when it was just the band in a van. You know, now I'm seeing two huge tour buses. I'm seeing a giant rig. Right. What do you remember about those days? Well, one thing, we, we got the Sadies opening up, trailing behind us in their van and trailer. So we just have to look behind us to see what it was like <laughs> back then. Traces of the past <laughs> right out the back window. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it? I've heard a lot this week. Uh, what day of the week is it? <laughs> that seems to happen a lot. Like people. Well, the road is a, <clears throat> an endless chain of the same day. It's very much like Groundhog Day, the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just hoping that one day you're going to get it right. You, you have to pass an enormous amount of time. And when you go out and initially, you have an enormous amount of energy to pass that time really valuably. And then after a while, you're quite happy to do nothing. You're quite happy to, to, to spend it worthlessly. And that feels OK. Clint, what you do on the road? Uh, I don't know. It's sort of uh, similar to Jim. I try and, uh, try and keep myself from falling into a permanent somnambulistic state. <laughs> and then usually, and then after a while, I give in. <laughs> Just before you embark on a tour, you have to enter a mindset. You yeah. get into the bubble. Yeah, the days of the week don't really matter very much. So it's not important. You don't let go of <clears throat> important information. The days of the week don't matter. Where you are matters. Right. You can see it's critical. Well, for you yeah. it's important because you have to have the right sweater on. But I don't think it's as important for the rest of us. <laughs> the right hockey sweater? <laughs> Go Lethbridge! <laughs> I tried out for the Pats today. I didn't make it. At various stops along the tour, local hockey teams will give Jim Cuddy their club's jersey. Cuddy will often wear the city's jersey during the show. Jim has quite yeah, a collection. Yeah, it was, huh? it, was, it was a much more private thing before this tour. I just used to go in, get the jersey, take it home. Well, I didn't used to necessarily wear them on stage. You never wore but, them. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's, some of those places are so small. They love the, the charge they get out of seeing, you know, the, <clears throat> the, their jersey up on the stage. So I, so I, I like doing it. Oh, hey, medics, we're, medics. We're trying to do an interview here. <laughs> yeah. Just hurl yourself down. Just throw yourself. That's the result of our little ball hockey. This poor man <laughs> over here. After many shows, Blue Rodeo members and their crew will play ball hockey with the Sadies band and crew. This Regina game went to 2.30 in the morning. Final score this night, the Sadies winning a tight one, five games to four. I think it's amazing former recreation, you know, to do on a tour. It gets chippy out there. The Sadies are obvious. It's the Cuddy band versus the Sadies. And the Cuddies are hackers. The tell me, here, you can get a shot. Why, I, look at that. <laughs> That's from the game, and I got huge bruises here and here. Just hey, you know what? It's they a voluntary sport. They can't it's play a voluntary the game. Sport. They can't play the game. Oh. Really. So they have to compensate with the chippiness. I can't imagine Greg doing a jock, though. He was voted on our very first ball hockey game, MVP, most vocal player. <laughs> he is pure jock. Greg came to our high school as, a, as a, a kid that had given up on being a junior A goalie and played for our high school team and was brutal to us. I remember we used to do that, uh, the, breakaway, uh, the breakaway drill, and none yeah. of us wanted to do the breakaway drill because Keely would come out and hack you and chase they were, they you. They'd come so in on a breakaway, slow. he'd come out, wham! Well, we don't want to do the break today. <laughs> Let's just do two on ones. <laughs> Glenn was saying that he's never played hockey before, before, before this tour, I guess. But a drummer's reflexes is amazing. I don't know. I mean, it's beginner's luck. I'm in my late 30s, and I didn't suddenly expect to find myself being a, a top notch floor hockey goalie, but there you go. Life's full of surprises. <laughs> Boop, 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 boop.
It's nice that they have musical accompaniment, but you got to get out there and mix it up a little bit. You know, I'm just don't, not of the caliber of the great hockey players we have here. I, I think I fulfill a much better role behind the accordion. <laughs> When we first started against the Sadies, the Sadies were fantastic, and they worked us. And our team, a bunch of guys that never played hockey before. So we just, uh, first of all, so we're the team with heart. Oh, yeah! Well, we all the jerseys. <laughs>People weren't coming up when we first started and saying, you know, oh, this happened to me because of Try. They were just going, I saw you on TV. And it was easy. But so it developed gradually because I think we've been around a lot, so we've been a broader part of some people's lives. You know, sometimes people are telling you stories that are 10 years old, but that were important to them. Today there was, outside there was a, a eight-year-old waiting He's a Blue Rodeo fan. I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> Blue Rodeo would follow up their 1987 debut with another critical and commercial success, 1989's Diamond Mind. Rolling Stone magazine would also rally behind this release, calling it mature and intelligent and giving it four out of five stars. The American music industry is driven by profit much more than the Canadian music industry, and that the commodity has to be well-defined, packageable, and placeable on the front of a magazine cover. We're not uh, uh, beautiful, and we don't make people swoon, and so we don't have that kind of focus, uh, visual focus. In the United States, you have to be very easily definable. You have to say, this band is this. This band is defined by this voice. This is a really low voice, isn't it? And that's what this band is. And there's, there's no way that a band, I mean, Blue Rodeo would, could never be defined like that. First of all, just because there's two singers. So it's necessary with Blue Roadie to sort of experience it, to see it, to get the records, to figure it out. And I think that happens with a lot of Canadian bands. There's a lot of Canadian bands that are successful, are very diverse. They have, they have a lot, they do a lot of things. That, and they, they put a lot of creativity in a lot of different areas. And then when they go down the States, you know, it's, somebody says, okay, describe yourself in one word. And they can't do it, never being, having to do it before. And 
and not really being the type of band that could do that. It's very, it's difficult to describe to people, but we wouldn't continue to do the states or to, to go other places if we didn't feel like there was some kind of there was some kind of movement. Like there, if there was some, if there wasn't something new to do to experience. Yeah, I love going and playing in the U.S. And I, I think there's a lot of people in the U.S. who would who would really like Blue Rodeo if they were to hear them. So for that reason, I think there's a you know there's a good you know. There's a good reason to go, keep going back. And there's been enough uh, increase, slow increase in our popularity down there that, it, that it's actually, I find it enjoyable. Enjoyable to go to a bar that was, you know, three quarters full is now full. Greg and I sort of formed a partnership from the beginning that we thought was good, was positive. But do you necessarily sing the songs that you write? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can always tell which one you wrote by. It's really simple, yeah. It really is. We do, we do them on our own, and then we just sort of collaborate a little bit as they're getting, you know, towards being recorded. Well, in a Blue Rodeo band meeting, is there Greg Kent, Jim Kent, and then everyone else, and then you guys just got to chip away at whatever their visions are? No. No, there's Greg Kent. <laughs> <laughs> And, there's and, and then <laughs> in the creating of a song, the songs become very precious to you somehow. And it's hard to, uh, to share that. It's usually us trying to chip away at him. So I know in my case, I've often become a little over uh, protective of the songs, you know? He's pretty, he stands pretty tall and strong. He's a hard guy when he gets something in his head to change it. I think just having a band is, is there's a challenge to just, uh, getting all those personalities to play together and everyone plays beautifully in our band and we're lucky that you know you get to hear that and have it be part of your song and the frustration you want to get away from it make solo records to go separate but coming back it always feels like that is it is a rut but it is a beautifully constructed rut you know we really have got this good band Despite hip-hop, grunge, and alt-rock ruling the charts in the early to mid-90s, Blue Rodeo's sound would turn on more people than ever with their stripped-down masterpiece, Five Days in July. Coming up on the story of Blue Rodeo. Whatever the intimacy was that we were all sort of sharing as the band, you know, playing those songs, I think translated into the recording. In 1993, work would begin on the follow-up to Lost Together. The effort would start out as a demo, then turn into an EP, then finally an entire album. The band recorded Five Days in July in a communal setting at Greg's Farm near Port Hope, Ontario. Guest vocalists on the disc included Sarah McLaughlin. The late-night free-flowing jam sessions resulted in what some critics have called Blue Rodeo's best record to date. How will you ever know the way that circumstances go? Surprise. Well, I think we really enjoyed making that record. We would just sit around and play a group of songs. We had a large group of songs at the time, too. Whatever the intimacy was that we were all sort of sharing as the band, you know, playing those songs, I think translated into the recording. And, uh, you know, it is a, it's an intimate record.
The album, essentially, this new one, is this. You spend five days just jamming, hanging out, and recording. Yep. No, it was a very uh, relaxed and satisfying thing. We did it actually two runs, one five days in June, and then we sort of realized what to do, and then we went back and did it for a week in July. And those were the performances that we kept. At your home? Yeah. In your living room? In my living room. There was a very warm and comfortable atmosphere, and the, the great outdoors made a big difference, you know, it was a big part of deciding whether we got it right or not. Blue Rodeo proved they got it right, as Five Days in July would become their biggest selling album to date, exceeding five times platinum in Canada alone. In the, the acoustic record, we brought a truck up and just played in the living room. We were, it was quiet enough that we could sit beside each other and play, and, and so, that was, those were just, that was like a little, like it was a series of concerts that we got the best performance. And maybe soon there'll come a day When no more tears will fall We each forgive a little bit Then we both look back on it It's just that time and that song there is some kind of comfort in other people's misery. Well, but just melancholy guess, is but a yeah. very pleasant. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a for current, some people. current to sort of to to be connected to when you're listening to music, and it, it soothes the wounded soul. We each forgive a little bit, and we both look back on it. It's just that time in that soul. What do you do when you're hearing someone come up to you and say, you know, I broke up with my wife, and that song brings back a lot of memories of that time? You give them a hug if they look like they need one. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all. I always try, I mean, I always find it a, sort of an amazing thing. You know, you're, you, there's just a natural response to somebody. Somebody's telling you something that's pretty, uh, pretty naked and pretty honest. And uh, uh, I think somebody came up to me at the jazz gig and said that her, her father had died, like, in September, and they had used bad timing was his favorite song, so they had it playing when they buried him. Mm. And you could oh, see yeah, how fresh this was to her. And I, you know, I, I mean, I, I was sort of moved by what she was feeling, what she was so apparently feeling right then. I, I think that one of the hardest things for songwriters is to write about uh, happiness, because the happiness is a very spontaneous and passing sensation. For some reason, you always seem to dwell on tragedy and melancholy, and that just seems to be where the where the mind goes. It's just darkness is a is something that is fascinating, and that that you want to keep elaborating upon. All Blue Rodeo's members have been prolific with side or solo projects. Greg Keeler was first out of the box with a major label solo disc, 1997's Gone, it was inspired by his six-week vacation to India and the search for his birth mother. How do your bandmates feel about you going out to do this? I think they're all actually quite thrilled, you know, in as much as that, you know, like, there's a sort of type of song that has been in Blue Rodeo, you know, songs. And I think that they'll just be happy that, like, that that's done, you know? And that I think that when I come to do the Blue Rodeo thing, I'll be more relaxed about, you know, whatever it is I have to say for, yeah. you know, whatever, you know, oh, I gotta do this, and I gotta do this, and I, I gotta do this song, and I gotta do this song, you know? So I got a lot of that out of the way, and now I can just, you know, play some music with my friends. Jim Cuddy released his debut solo in 1998. <laughs> In order to play in a band, you have to be prepared to be a bit of a supporting piece. And by times, people don't want to be that. They want to be a unique, single-supported voice in it, whatever their instrument. And uh, time off gives people a chance to go and lend their voice to other things, do their own projects, or play with other people. When you come back, it doesn't seem so bad to be a supporting piece anymore. It's great to have a, a, a band that contributes such unique voicings to it. You just don't get so critical. You're just glad that they're there.
I'm sure a lot of comments other bands get is, you know, I got married to that song, I fell in love to that song. With Blue Rodeo, is it the, almost the opposite? We get both. Yeah. I don't think it doesn't seem an undue amount of, of uh, pain people are sharing. Oh, sure. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Because I hear mostly the weddings. So maybe it's a lot yours, of maybe your songs. No, no, I, a lot. Of, I don't. I hear only good stuff. The break. A lot of nurses break up to your songs. No, I hear that with my solo project. Oh yeah. I have. Bring, I give all, pretty much exclusively divorced <laughs> audience. I think making the solo records was a pause in the festivities, and it was, and it allowed us when we came back, to slowly change it to something else. And. <clears throat> it's necessary. Blue Rodeo's bassist Basil Donovan has played on Jim's solo record, Bob Egan's solo disc, and records for Stephen Fearing, Linda McRae, O oh Susanna, and others. Drummer Glenn Milcham has released two records with his side project, The Swallows. I'm trying not to shout, but I'm beginning to have my doubts. Yeah, it's good to go play with other people, have outside influences, have, uh, different experiences and then bring it back to the band, you know? Mm -hmm. You learn a lot every, every time you play, you know, with different people, or every time you play, period, you learn something. Keyboardist James Gray has played on records by the Sadies, Mary Jane Lamont, and others. Newest member Bob Egan has just released his solo disc. Bob Egan was a member of Wilco for five years before joining Blue Rodeo in 1999. For you to leave the U.S. to want to come to Canada to work with Blue Rodeo, is kind of a testament to them? Oh, absolutely. It's the whole package. I mean, uh, my first tour with Blue Rodeo three years ago, we did 80 shows coast to coast, and every night we had a meet and greet with 100 to 150 people. That's a lot of Canadians. Mm -hmm. And every one of them came up to me and said, welcome. So they all had a story about what Blue Rodeo meant to their lives. And uh, they welcomed me. And I just saw it was such a big part of the Canadian fabric. Hmm. And they're a great bunch of guys. Bob's first recorded work with his new band would be two new tracks on their 2001's Greatest Hits. It could happen to you. It could happen to you. Blue Rodeo's Greatest Hits would feature 12 career gems and two new recordings. You know, the Greatest Hits for us was a, was a document, and, and it was a way to, buy, you know, to carve out a piece of time where we didn't have to go out and, and uh, do a lot of playing, which of course we did anyway. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it seemed like time and people want it. Around the time of the solo records, just after that, there was the Greatest Hits record. People were assuming this is it for the band. So you're not supposed to go off and do solo projects. Was, history has shown in other bands when that happens, that's the beginning of the end for the collective unit. Um, you were hearing that a lot. Whether or not it was actually happening to the band is one thing, but once you're hearing it a lot, being asked, is the band okay? Is the band still intact? What's, what's going on in your head? Well, I always say uh, it was unfortunate for me because I have a warehouse full of T-shirts that say Greg Keeler, formerly of Blue Rodeo. <laughs> At any time where there are rumors of our imminent demise, it's usually the time when we're most firmly entrenched in being together. You know, we're in the midst of making a record. Uh, we bought a studio, we bought a building and put a studio in, and, and I mean, just the notion that we would all buy that together, you know, I was like, I mean, we're in it for at least a good, good long time from now. Many people out there still think we have broken up. So it's just, and there's no amount of reassurance you can give them. It's just, <laughs> so you're still with the band? Yeah, you just saw us play. And, oh, that's good. I'm glad you guys are going to stick it up. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I think people think what they're going to think. And uh, by the time we were even hearing those rumors, it was, it had been a year and a half. We all both made our solo records and toured them. So. It was a good thing. Lose your touch out there standing in the rain When it's all too much You feel like slipping down again Somebody waits for the time I know it never comes You get yourself so high And you come down feeling blue Still to come on, the story of Blue Rodeo. Keep it close to the heart and sing what you know about, you know, because you have to sing those songs all the time. You know? And be incredibly good looking. And then we've managed to do that too. <laughs> Tell me one more time again, just like I didn't hear. 
like I don't know what's going Blue Rodeo's on latest mind. disc is 2002's Palace of Gold. I played the same game too. I know it's hard to stop even when you want to. Now the moon lights up your face. I can see you're crying. Never like me to see you cry. It's true. I've done some crying too. The hardest part about it is trying to hide it from you. The album is a departure for Blue Rodeo. Besides being the first full length disc with newest member Bob Egan, it also features a four piece horn section and a ten piece string section. It's been said that this band, you know, really does take a lot of pride and time and attention into the way a record is recorded and how it's recorded, more so than most bands. I think we just like the process. <laughs> we like making records. I mean, this went to the point where we actually built a studio and uh, made the atmosphere be exactly what we wanted it to be. <clears throat> but I think that for us, it was it's more about um, building something that we can live in for however long that's going to be. For this record, it was a long time. When you introduce a horn section, <laughs> you're really going out on a limb. A fiasco. It, it could have, yeah, it could have gone that way, and it didn't. I think we go into things pretty blindly. I think I didn't, it didn't feel like a big yeah. It didn't feel like that at all. I, in fact, we've been touring even, for a year with them already. But I was surprised when we came out here that, that reading stuff, there was a great relief in the reviews that oh, it had worked out. <laughs> I think wow, there's a lot of anxiety out here in the West to, that the horn section was going to change the band, or that it wouldn't be a good thing. And I think, well, we're very cloistered, you know, we do things to suit ourselves. I think a lot of what you do in this business is cocooned. You just do what you think is best. And it, and everybody that's close to you says, it's great, it's great, it's great. And you go to concerts, it's great, it's great, it's great. You don't really find out till later what, what people really thought. Mm -hmm. Or you read something, wow, I didn't know they were worried about that. You just carry on just using your own instincts. And it's obviously it's necessary to keep your world small. Like how could we anticipate what and the people across the country might like or not like. Right. Couldn't. To me, it just sort of seems obvious that it's an institution. Uh, just that, you know, there's been a generation of people that have grown up with it and that there's a new generation of people that are into it. I mean, we have a lot of people, you know, we have kids that come out that were into Blue Rodeo because their parents were into Blue Rodeo. And, uh, so, you know, I guess that makes us an institution of sorts. And, and the fact that we're a Canadian cultural phenomenon, you know, we're a Canadian thing. So, it, you know, it kind of makes it an institution of sorts. We are still trying to, you know, make good records and, and uh, you know, we're still trying to approach it like it's a fresh new thing. We want to keep it alive and vital. It's a blessing to be known that you're playing in something that is an institution. And I've been doing it for 10 years. It's just that way that something becomes part of the cultural fabric of a country. When, when, you, when you become that, you become part of the heart. And, when you're, and that takes on an iconic status. So you'll, you will hear them, you know, people play Blue Rodeo songs at weddings. You'll be on a lake. Maybe you'll hear coming from the cottage down the street. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you just see, I mean, I see the guys when they move through, you know, they move through town. And whether it's, you know, a, a hockey game or somewhere else, people just, they got to talk to them, have a little little piece, and it just means that you're revered, and that's not so bad. Well, how does that make you feel when the word institution can be used to describe this band at this point now? We don't think about that too much. You know, our lives are, are still pretty busy <laughs> making music. We had played in a lot of bands by 85, and, you know, we'd already lived three years in New York and had bands in Toronto from 78. And, and seeing how styles of music can change so vastly you know, over a short period of time. And then I think one of the real touchstone gigs was when we opened up for Chris Christopherson. If I look like a good old friend who's good at bending with the wind. Blue Rodeo opened for Chris Christopherson at this gig in May 1986 at Toronto's Diamond Club.
and just getting a real appreciation for his career and where songs can take you. And just the way he had sort of steered him, or his career had steered him. And, and, and just, uh, that seemed like a good plan to have. You know, keep it, keep it close to the heart and sing what you know about, you know, because you have to sing those songs all the time. You know? And be incredibly good looking. And then we've managed to do that too. <laughs> There's a good career. There's no doubt about it. It's great. It's a better job than any other we could get at this point. <laughs> you do all right. I don't know. No, I've always thought that, huh? But my association with you could hurt me. <laughs>